Okay, let's take a look at risk management. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay, great. Um, now, what happens here is that we need to look at risk management because you can sometimes overdo it, can't you? You can be too critical. It costs you so much to make the product that you have to charge so much that nobody buys it. That can happen. Or you can be not brutal enough and end up providing a product that never works or only lasts for a very short period of time. That happens a lot on Radio Shack products other than components. So you've got to worry about that situation. So what you do is you actually have this purpose of this to make a decision. Are you conformant or non-conformant to a particular specification? How about the limits that you need to do or calibration limits of permissible error? It would be great if you could take a new machine stuff and never make a measurement, right? That has to do with that dial on the uh, equipment yeah. you were talking about. Yeah, you, what's the point of it? Nobody ever does it that yeah. way. They use a micrometer or a tool and measure it exactly as they're machining it. Probably been better if they'd bought machines that didn't have the dials. Right. Just a little crank. Yeah. On that. Now, then what you've got to have is a certain confidence that the decision is proper. So you have conformance or non-conformance perceived incorrectly due to a measurement error. So you've got to concern yourself with that. Anybody here have an example of where they made a measurement error, thought someone, something was good, but it wasn't? You ever have that happen? Mm -hmm. You have, right? Mm -hmm. How about you, Joe? Have you, have you ever heard of? Not, a, not in the calibration aspect of it, but I've heard of what if you're using the calibrator equipment? We're talking about confidence in the equipment that's been calibrated or confidence in what we're using to calibrate. We're looking at that aspect of it. So when you take a look at, say, this object that's being built by you, and what happens is, is that if you have set the tolerance as such, that you're going to get a false accept risk, meaning that, hey, it looks like it passed. Send it out, send it out, send it out. This is a consumer risk. Now, what's bad with a consumer risk? When you just have reputation. That's right. People stop buying things, don't they, or even using it. So the probability of accepting out of tolerance units. So you've got to work out a compromise. How about a false reject risk? This is the producer. You're making something. And what happens is you say, oh, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. This is not good enough. In reality, they were fine. So what happens to your production costs? They go up. What happens to your uh, production costs go up? So therefore, the item costs more, doesn't it? Now you lose your competitive advantage. This is an interesting situation to happen. Are you familiar with, um, oh, friend, do I have it in my pocket? I don't. I'll think of it in a little bit. It has to do with a knife. Who is one of the better knife makers around? Buck. 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 Trump, yeah. Now, Buck actually moved an operation over to effectively China. And so what they were doing is they were actually making the um, lower cost of pocket, pocket knives and all this kind of stuff in China. But they found out that the reliability, the acceptance, or the product was all over the place. They moved it back to Idaho. And they got a much better product that's much more reliable and things like that. So don't believe that it's cheaper to make it in China. Some outfits are actually coming back to the U.S. It has to do with this false accept or false risk. Okay? And um, in the United States, we do an excellent job. <clears throat> so what happens is we have these risk management things. We got to manage the confidence in the decision making whether we accept a product or reject a product. And that's pretty important. And this is based on the relationship between tolerances and measurement uncertainty. This is where I, when you see the tolerance used, we tolerate this, and the measurement uncertainty is what that, so it depends on what manufacturer you're working with and things like that. So what happens here as far as these levels of risk, you would be taking and uh, maybe through a meeting or 
maybe through your customers, depending on whether you're selling directly to the Army or Navy or the public, you'd come up with a mutual understanding, wouldn't you? <coughs> and then, of course, you have the situation as far as a contractual agreement. You'd agree to certain information. And, of course, it either is a military or an industrial standard. How many here work with military standards? Okay, how many will no longer work with military standards? You need to raise your hand. Because guess what's happening? Remember I told you? They're outlaw and they're getting rid of all the military standards. The older products that refer to it, yes, they'll still do that. But the military and the federal government, all those are moving towards the international standards, per se. So you have the starting point. Then you have to define your strategies. In fact, you're doing this when you're doing your testing, aren't you? Yep. You define your strategy, the probability and statistics of this thing working right or wrong. And that requires a pretty god good darn knowledge of the process you're working with. Maybe you've never done the process before. How do you do this? Some, you might hire a consultant, right? And they have experience doing this. You might look at some of the training that exists to do this. And then what happens is you can simplify this using what they call implied acceptable levels of risk. How much risk do you tolerate? So let's look at this implied acceptable. Now, here's a case. And what does this say, uh, Joe, right there? Near zero risk. Take into account the actual uncertainty. Now, what happens when you build something with near zero risk? That's mean you made it 99.99% or 9999%. Uh, is it going to be cheap? No. Is it going to cost more? Absolutely. Support might be a problem. Now, when HP put in their enterprise-wide mail system, they wanted 99.999% uptime. No dropping down, off, or anything like that. Needless to say, that cost a chunk of money. But they needed to have that ability. You know, it's kind of neat to be able to take an email to somebody anywhere on the earth and get there within about five seconds. On that. Back in the early days when they did this implementation, you might be lucky to get your email in an hour, the way it was working. Because you know how internet works, right? You don't know how your route's going to go, do you? What happens if your message goes through uh, uh, Elephant's Breath, Montana? And the system goes down. It's going to waste. It's going to take more time. Eventually, they'll say, oh, okay, send it another route on that. But then when you go through the world, you don't know whether you're going to go to Russia, China, wherever it may be on the Internet situation. So you've got to worry about that. So you don't want, uh, you want zero, near zero risk. And that's why they put that system in, to get that near, near risk. Of course, what this is, is a 10 to 1. Now, when I originally calibrated equipment, that was our goal, 10 to 1. But the accuracies or the uncertainties, accuracies at that time, uncertainties now of the equipment being calibrated was such that it was easy to achieve a 10 to 1 ratio. With a 10 to 1 ratio, do you really even need statistical analysis? No. You know, it's so much there that you don't need to worry about it. But with, uh, with tolerances getting closer and closer together, to be able to be assured that you're meeting this, or accuracies or uncertainties getting tighter, you'll need to be able to go beyond or less than that 10 to 1 risk. Now, in your case there, they might have overdone it, 2 to 1. And when we look at a risk chart, you'll see what I mean. 4 to 1 accuracy ratio tends to be the standard that they'll use today. By the way, the 4 to 1 is what they call a rule of thumb. A rule of thumb. And then, of course, when you look at the actual error analysis or the uncertainty, that's more precise than a rule of thumb. Um, I'm going to tell you about a little historical event here. I don't want to offend anybody, but have you heard the rule of thumb years before? I've heard the term rule of yeah. thumb. Yeah. About you. Have you heard the term rule of thumb? Yeah. All of us have, haven't we? Did you know that that's old English law? 
That's actually an old English law, the rule of thumb. And it has to do with the fact that a man was allowed to beat his wife as long as the stitch was smaller than his thumb, the diameter. And that's now when you hear that term now, you're gonna look at it totally different, aren't you? But that's where it came from. But we use it all the time, don't we? We use it all the time. Gee, you guys, I guess you haven't wasn't very good there, was it? <laughs> What's that? Uh, I won't be using that one again. <laughs> well, you always use rule of thumb, don't you? It, uh, <laughs> not, the, not the practical application. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is, is that's where it came from. Yeah. Of course, it means something entirely different now, doesn't it? Yeah. It means entirely something different. Amazing how history tends to... Remember how a yard was defined? Yeah. yeah, basically from essentially the tip of the nose to... Thumb specifically was a yard. How about a cubit? You ever hear of that one? That had to do with a lot of commerce with respect back in the early days. And they had to keep it a specific way. And if you didn't have it right, like the right weight kind of stuff, do you know what the penalty was? Death. I'm serious. They were very serious about the commodity exchanges and that. So this has kind of been since the, almost like the beginning of time specifically on that. So this is the rule of thumb. Now when we look at the ISO 9000 quality standards, and by the way, it hasn't been that long since ISO 9000 started to become prevalent. When it initially started, no company was required to do it. Not at all. It was just a suggestion. But as it got further and further along, they said, well, gee, are you ISO certified or have you passed that requirement? And they said, yeah, well, okay, we want to do business with you. So it kind of evolved into the standards aspect that it has today. Originally, it didn't require anything at all. And capable of the necess necessary accuracy. At what risk? So if you look at the low risk strategy, here is like, uh, for instance, the increasing measurement uncertainty, going from very small to very large. So we have a specification zone. You can hear is this the lower specification limit, the upper specification limit, and you have that. And then right here, this is talks about the type of uncertainty that exists. You have like point double oh one here. This might be one percent, two percent. You see it gets more and more, or excuse me, I'm sorry, it gets more restrictive okay, as we go that direction. So what happens here is that maybe at this level, what happens is that you produce passes. Whereas if we're working at this level, you can see, gee, it looks up almost, gosh, looks almost uh, a half or 60% is all that you get there. Europe would like to use this. The U.S. says that's way too restrictive. There's no way you need to be that restrictive. Because what would happen to the cost of goods if you were at this level? Go quite a bit up, wouldn't it? And uh, World War II, my father had like a machine shop. He made parts for remodeling uh, sewing machines and that. He had what they called a reverse and the older sewing machines, like the Singer sewing machines, they would not go in reverse. So he designed and implemented a device to have a handle to go up and down, and it would allow you to go forward and backward on the machine itself. And then he also had a, what they called a patchmatic. That was a situation where you hit a button and it releases the pressure on the foot so you can move it around. Most of them have that now. He actually had the patent for that, in the United States specifically and made and sold those. And it turns out that during World War II, the government inspected this equipment, looking at the risk aspect of it. They said, we want you to build this part. Trouble was, they didn't look at the uncertainty of the process. The equipment that he had was not good enough to make that part. So what happened was, he'd make the part, he did send it over to his friend who was able to either correct it or make it more precise. And so every part he delivered to the government cost him money. 
Now, a lot of people made a lot of money in World War II. But in this case here, he had a pretty high risk, didn't he? He was losing money because of it. Of course, they didn't look at it this way in World War II either. He just didn't have the proper equipment to do the job. Now, if you look at statistical reasoning, there's a test item dis distribution, and this could be the uncertainty zone. And the uncertainty no zone is up in this area. Now, what I mean by that is if you look at the item, a voltmeter, whatever it is, it has a certain uncertainty associated with it. And we're going from this, and it turns out, if you look at this point here, and this point here, they're basically the same point, aren't they? And you have an uncertainty of this out there. That's that K equal 2 situation. You have this uncertainty. And what happens is if you're on the outside limit, you can see how this can move? How it can move? So when you calibrate a device, you kind of want that uncertainty to be in this region, don't you? You know, make the adjustments, make sure it's right on. You send the device out, right? When you send the device out, uh, it moves a little bit, maybe drifts, and comes back in. And that uncertainty zone is now here. Okay, but it still passes requirements, doesn't it? And then maybe the third time out, it's out here. Now, it's still, with, uh, still within, but here's where the problem comes in. Will it stay within the next calibration cycle? So you've got to be concerned with it. Maybe we actually make a measurement, and if you look at the uncertainty of the measurement, it falls out the zone like this. And that can happen. Have you ever heard the term guard banding? You heard the term guard banding? That kind of, I'm sure you have, haven't you? And you have. And what do you interpret guard banding as being, Rich? The guard banding is where you have a, 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 a tolerance or acceptable. Yes. Uh, and then you put basically limits inside that. It's like a warning, a warning saying that you're coming close to becoming. That's that right. Tolerance. What you've got is you've got your tolerances here or uncertainty. And the guard banding says we want it to always be within this region. Because what happens is if we go out the outer region, there's an uncertainty that falls outside the region of acceptance. Even though you make a measurement inside, it could be outside because of the uncertainty of that particular measurement. And so you can actually have equipment calibrated with a key site that has guard banding built into it. Of course, what happens is that if you fall into that region, you're not even outside it, but you're in that region where the uncertainty of the measurement does, then they have to bring it in, retest it, and then make adjustments to bring it in. The adjustments aren't manually done anymore on current equipment. It's done with software programs. And likewise, what happens in the standard calibration lab, you don't have all this software. Some manufacturers won't even make it available to you. So you actually have to send it to them to get that taken. So the guard banding is a way of making a more restrictive aspect to it. Now right here, if you look at the calibration system requirements, there's some mil specs. And you'll notice if you look at the mil standard 45662, it says collective uncertainty of measurement standards will not exceed 25% of the tolerance. Does not relate measurement uncertainty to a specific measurement decision risk. It's just a standard thing, right? Of course, that's it's been replaced with other things. So when we take a look at the four to one equipment accuracy ratio, it's a rule of thumb. They just pick. It used to be ten to one. Now it's four to one. And uh, of course, you said yours was two to one there for a while. Yeah, we're, we're going back to four. To one. And it does not relate to the measurement uncertainty to a specific measurement decision risk. No uniform confidence accepted here. Now right here, ISO 10012-1 is the quality assurance requirement for measurement equipment. And if you look at this, look at the dashes. What does the first dash say, Joe? Must take into account all significant uncertainties in the measurement process. It's everything that's uh, significant. Notice the term significant. 
What's dash two, Rob? Uh, measurement error should be no more than one third and preferably one tenth of permissible error. That has to do with the guard banding in a sense, isn't it? And then what does the third one say, uh, Rich? Possible to determine the statistical relationship between measurement uncertainty and specific measurement decision risks. Okay, remember, measurement decision risks. We haven't looked at those carefully yet, but we will. And here's the accuracy ratios. You will see these terms, TAR, and it's defined in the, in the specifications. Test accuracy ratio. TUR, test uncertainty ratio. TEAR, equipment accuracy ratio. So you've got these terms that exist within this realm on that. Have you heard, seen these used before, Joe? I think it's hard until I saw this more on one of the other councils that we were Mm -hmm. On a certificate. How about you, Rich? No, that doesn't mean. So this is new terminology, doesn't yeah. it? Like I said, it's in these documents that we talk about, and the main one is what? Gum. Yeah. Gum. It says conformance zone is the specification zone for items to be proven acceptable. This is where the guard banding comes into effect. To be able to meet that requirement, we want it here. Not more than 25% or 50% of the uncertainty situations. So we're setting that. What to do when the TAR or TUR are not acceptable? Use guard banding to increase tolerance limits. All right. Shandi, read this, please, the technique. Again, technique of setting test limits inside uh, narrower than specification limits to reduce the risk of falsely accepting out of tolerance items due to excessive measurement or calibration uncertainty. You see, you, they, they get this false accept or false reject that we need to concern ourselves with when it comes to actually manufacturing. Now, in your case, if you have two or three or four items going into space, you're going to have that really tight, aren't you? Yeah, with the, uh, but this guard banding is, comes into, I can think of right off the bat, is with our torque wrenches. Uh -huh. You know, the uh, torque wrenches are like 10%, plus or minus 10% or something like that. Uh, we have our set at 4%. If it goes outside of 4%, then I have to, then we have this, you know, risk or a, uh, a form. It's a, a RIN is what they call it. And you have to go back and check what you use that torque wrench on on whatever hardware you use to make to see whether uh, that 4% can... Where are these happen. torque wrenches typically used? Plates that are on the... Let's see, on on everything from, in, from assembling hardware to uh, putting the hardware... I use it specifically for uh, putting instrumentation or mounting the hardware onto, the, onto our... You know, the, picture plates in the, in the... Now, is this particular test equipment going to be going with the device? The, the te no, the, uh, the torque wrenches are used for tightening the bolts and all that stuff. And then we send the torque wrenches go back for calibration. Yeah. The calibration lab has it set, has the tolerance is set at 4%. Okay. Uh, the manufacturer has it set at 10%. And so yeah, I agree product, with that. But what I'm saying is that if you're taking a mounting equipment in a rack, do you do that? Yeah. And you use the torque wrench on that? No, no. no. Okay. So if you have equipment that you're mounting inside a, a, a vehicle, then right. you're going to be using the torque wrench. How many of you have ever gone to Walmart or Sears or that kind of thing and bought tires? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. How about you? Have you ever noticed something of these companies, what they do after they actually take and mount the tires and put them back on? Oh, with a torque wrench on the lugs? Yeah. Do yeah. you notice how, how they do it in a gas station? They just... The air hammer yep. bit. Now, the reason they do it that way at these other larger organizations, and it's right to do it, not only does the technician do the torque wrench, the actual manager or supervisor does it again. And it has to do with liability. If the tire happens to fall off, hey, we did this and this, it's not our fault on that. 
Frankly, I approve that better than I do the doggone impact ranch approach because you can strip it on the impact ranch, can't you? Yep. And this is a situation where they need to have that calibrated properly, don't they? Especially from a legal standpoint. So what happens here is that the guard banding is a very important concept with everything, frankly, not just calibration stuff. Using statistical reasoning with the assumed probability distributions, measurement and certainty can be related to a specific decision risk. Example, guard bank for equipment, equivalent risk. Assume normal distributions with 95% uh, tolerance or confidence. That means K equal 2, doesn't it? When you talk about statistical, K equal 2. Implied false accept risk requiring a 4 to 1 tar. This comes, corresponds to a false accept risk of nearly 1%. If the actual TAR is 2 to 1, test accuracy ratio, then false except risk is 1.5. Use guard band factor of 0.91 to narrow test limits. False except decision is now back to 1%. And this kind of approach can be used with lots of things. Now let's look at this. Relation of risk to TAR. Now you are you have to go to four to one, don't you? And you'll notice here here's this color, false accept risk, and here false reject risk. It's between 0.9 and 1.6. Look at two to one. That's quite a big difference, isn't it? And they want you to get down to your, of course ten to one. Look at ten to one. It's virtually zip. And that's what the uh, calibration test standards had to be when I was involved as a technician back in the, back in the, um, wasn't really that far back. I don't consider uh, 1969 or 61 that far back. You may, but I don't. I've got a problem. I almost remember everything. Make sure we get in trouble with your wife. You know, just forget about it, don't argue about it. Luckily I can do what they call, um, Look at something and remember where it is. Come back and get it. So remember the big books that I was telling you I was going to carry in? Well, I could tell exactly, approximately, within two pages, where that information would be, just by scanning through it, which is a good thing. All right, so the test equipment uh, accuracy ratio, you can see how, why they went to a 4 to 1, can't you? Versus the 2 to 1. You wanted to improve it. Somebody looked at it from this relationship. Hey, wait a minute, we can't do that. This also, this makes it easier to do the job, though, doesn't it? This, of course, makes it more restrictive, right? How about you, Rob? What is the ratio do you think you use? I think four to one. Four to one. Now you can see why. It's very important on that. And this is not just calibration, is it? The four to one is your measurement systems and everything else involved there. Here's some additional uh, guidance notes. This is in your book. It tells you uncertainty analysis for risk management. Uh, note the date, 1995. And then you have how to maintain your confidence in a world of declining test uncertainty ratios. Proceedings, 1993. And then 1994 and then 1995. So these are some things you can go in and look more information in this area. Remember, we're just introducing you to the concepts things of this nature. Now what happens here is that this is all pretty current, isn't it? Go back 20 years and they didn't care that much about it. What would happen between like 93 and 98 to cause all these things to, because that's when it seems like everything has changed between 93 and um, 98. We started getting more international notice of it, started getting more involved with, with France and all these committees and that kind of thing. Before that, it was pretty much on the individuals themselves and the companies, what they decided. Then it became more and more aware of in this area. And that's where the change happened. And if you'll notice, there's a lot of documents now. Well, if you take a look at this, uh, this one here, 2013, right? That's about as current as you can get. I believe this one's 2011. And so what happened there is a lot of contracts and other things went out 
you need to do this, you need to do this, and that's what happens before that. Rob, do you do much uh, of the uh, uncertainty analysis? Are you going to avoid it now that we talked about it? Yeah. <laughs> but you used to wear it. Now, the one thing you learn then is you're aware of, I don't want to get involved with this stuff. Okay? But remember, it's terminology and ideas of what's going on here. By the way, we do have a course on uncertainty. It's three days. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, I'm talking about just that subject, you know, chapter six or whatever. Three days of that stuff. And let's say that that's the kind of thing that allows you to go to sleep. Because it's nothing but mathematics. Again, the software applications I was telling you about was the uncertainty analyzer and its accuracy ratio. You can probably go in and do a search and come up with a hundred different companies. Then you say, which one is the better one? Well, again, if you start going to certain meetings of groups and you start talking to people and some Joe said, hey, this thing stinks. You know, I tried it. Somebody else said, this is the right one to get. It really helped me out. Again, that communication of these organizations is extremely important. Hey, we're doing pretty good, aren't we?